Uh, this is our first webinar, the first time SAFME is hosting one of these. As you know, we're used to standing out in front of you in the classroom and lecturing, so please be a little bit patient in case we experience some technical difficulties. We do have some staff that are, or members that have joined that may not be used to Microsoft Teams, um, so please appreciate that fact. Hopefully everybody's found their chat box. Hopefully everybody, well, it looks like it. Everybody's doing very well on the chat box. Um, and I'm just going to have a quick glance at how many participants are on at the moment. There are 19 people, so we are still short of a few, but let's get going into the content. The coordinators of today's session are myself and Nanette Warburton. Uh, just to chat to you a little bit about Nanette. Nanette has a background uh, as that of a theatre unit manager. Uh, Nanette left uh, nursing a couple of years ago and joined, well, no, not nursing per se, but uh, was restored with NECARE um, in her role in procurement. And her role in procurement included both capital equipment and consumables. So Nanette's job um, is to find products for us. To, Nanette is a really useful source of information if you need to uh, find anything, even if it's not something safe in itself, uh, you, can, you can go to her. She can help you source a, a wide variety of things. My name is Zana Jardine. I'm Head of Education for SAFMED. If there are any of you that don't know me, um, I have a master's degree in nursing and my master's focus is all around um, CCSD and CCSD matters. I'm also the chairperson of the CFSA, the CCSD Forums of South Africa, um, and I spend time hosting, presenting, teaching all around decontamination sciences. I, of course, uh, am an ex-theatre matron back in the day, um, and uh, hopefully you will enjoy what we have to, to, uh, to share and to teach you today. SAFMIT has now uh, launched our educational offerings in a digital format. We understand uh, with lockdown and our current circumstances that we all do still need training and we are all desperate to learn stuff. Um, but we really need an alternate method of, of communicating. And as a result, um, we have launched these programs. In fact, our CCC Foundation course uh, we've been planning to launch that digitally for quite some time. We've been working on it for almost a year already, and that is now almost ready to get to get released. We actually promised that to um, to numerous head offices to use to train their own staff, and that will become available soon. Uh, today we're doing our first webinar series, as you know, and the other thing we'll be launching in the next couple of days is our express e-learning. Express e-learning will be a scenario where um, in some format, in a PDF format, you'll receive a single page document that contains a summary of pertinent information. You'll be able to read and study that document. We'll send you a link to forms, it's called, where you can actually write a test and we'll acknowledge receipt and um, see how you've actually fared. The idea is that it's short snippets of information that are pertinent to our current day practices that you can then learn from, you can then test your knowledge, and you have a, a receipt of, of an acknowledgement of, of what you have learned and, and new things. That way, continuously keeping you abreast with a variety of information. We will focus both on CCSD and theatre-related topics. Nanette actually is really good at patient positioning and around that arena and theatre related and I'll focus more on our CECD topic so we'll keep you continuously trained and educated. I'm just checking the chat box where Mariki is still on music. Mariki, that may be because uh, your system is hanging. You could consider logging out and logging back in again. Okay, moving on in terms of our slides. Today's webinar is an introduction to managing instruments and devices contaminated by pathogenic microorganisms, uh, a topic that obviously is quite important, and as we know, all of our devices are contaminated at all times. 
We're going to cover a few main topics. Let's cover, um, have a look at what those will be. We'll go through the decontamination process, one that you know very well, but that we want you to focus on certain aspects of it. And of course, it's our, our basis of everything we do. We'll have a look at pathogenic microorganisms and more importantly, what we're exposed to when we're decontaminating devices. Everything we share with you today is based on numerous published papers. We'll also look at antiquated practices. Um, I also want to cover the in-depth or, or take you through what we'll cover in the upcoming uh, webinars as well. A very difficult, pricky subject, the reuse of single-use items under pandemic conditions. We'll talk about that. And of course, COVID-19 and the implications for operating theatres and CSSDs. We're all faced with a very difficult scenario at the moment. We, um, our operating theatres have been uh, closed for periods of time. Our hospitals are becoming inundated with very, very sick patients. In the CSSD, we're um, probably being expected that we, we now end up um, decontaminating a whole bunch of stuff and reprocessing things that we had not reprocessed before. And that can be tricky and it's, it's really a difficult scenario and, and times that are, are hard for everybody for a number of different reasons. In instrument reprocessing and decontamination of our instruments, those that are reusable, of course, the entire process begins at the beginning of purchasing a device. Either we purchase a device or we loan a device, but all of those devices need to come with a set of instructions, a set of manufacturer's instructions for use. And that actually is the basis for everything that we do. If anything went wrong and you had a patient who went septic and you were sued, uh, the first thing that any reasonable lawyer is going to say is, did you follow the correct process? Do you know what the process is? Can you please tell me what, what you do to reprocess a device? And if you've never read the manufacturer's instructions for that particular device, then you may be found wanting. So very important that we have those reprocessing instructions. Remember, it doesn't help to only listen to what the rep says because sometimes they can interpret information incorrectly um, or they mean well, but you don't get the whole story. So therefore, it's very, very important to read instructions for use. That may cover how you're supposed to reprocess, for example, a ringoscope blade, um, how you mean to do your eye instruments, what's the sterilization time for that particular device. Um, I once was uh, lecturing at the Eye Congress and I had a look at some pertinent information around some eye instruments and it clearly stated that the sterilization time needed to be four minutes. And I, I know numerous hospitals have their sterilization time set at three and a half minutes. And those are pertinent factors we need to bear in mind. All instruments, of course, after use need to be transported safely. And in that in that regard, both in terms of protecting people and protecting the instruments themselves. Once they arrive on the dirty side of the CSSD, we will need to clean them and clean them thoroughly. And how do we know that we've actually cleaned them? They also need to be disinfected at this point so that they are safe for us to handle when we're inspecting them. And that disinfection is not a chemical disinfection, that is thermal disinfection then we need to actually inspect them to make sure that they are clean and we need to find a way to validate or verify that something has or hasn't been cleaned. Once we finish cleaning a device, we're going to move it from the dirty side of the CSSD, well, hopefully it's now on the clean side of the CSSD, where we're inspecting it and we're inspecting it for proper use. Is it effective? Is it, is it damaged? Uh, does it need to go for repairs? Is it good to go? We'll be packaging our device in some form of packaging, depending on what it is, um, the type of device, and what the sterilization method is. Then we'll sterilize it either in a, in a high temperature or steam sterilizer, hopefully not in a flash, dear God, or immediate use steam sterilizer, and perhaps low temperature sterilization. Once it's sterile, we need to transport it, we need to store it, and we need to protect it that it doesn't become contaminated after we've done all of this hard work. 
then theatre come along and they're going to take all of these devices, they're going to take them to the operating room, they're going to use them on our patients. And of course, after that, they're contaminated with these terrible pathogens that we need to deal with, that we're all faced with every day. And then we need to transport them in their contaminated form in a manner that's safe so that we can get them to the CSSC, that we can start the process all over again. That's the cycle of the job that we do on, an every, on a daily basis. The cycle that I'm referring to, um, this particular uh, graphic, is taken from a UK-based set of guidelines. Those guidelines are readily available on the internet. If you ever need them, let me know. You can download them. I can send you the link. It's really fascinating information that we can learn from. Over my last 20 or 30 years in operating theatres and CSSDs, I think there are four pathogens that stick out the most for me, that have taught me the most amazing things, and that have taught us all a number of things. Back in the 80s, we had the whole scare around HIV uh, and, uh, and around hepatitis. We had um, recently, of course, Kruschevelt Jacobs disease, a few patients with uh, mad cow disease, and we were scared of Kruschevelt Jacobs disease because we know it's very, very difficult to decontaminate a device that is contaminated with uh, Kruschevelt Jacobs disease. It's not a pathogen per se, it's a misfolded protein, and it's very difficult to manage. There's no vaccine, there's no treatment, there's no cure. You get this disease, you bug it, as they say. And it really is a bit of a tricky scenario. So we were scared of Kruschevelt Jacobs disease. Then, of course, came CRE, carbapenem resistant enterobacteriaceae. That was another key word for us. We all tried to learn how to say that. It wasn't necessarily that easy. That easy. CREs, we know, are around. That taught us a hell of a lot about environmental decontamination. But we still can't see CRE. Now the big COVID, the big C, the COVID-19, and that scared the hell out of us. It really, truly really has. It's affected our life. It, it has an amazing amount of impact on us. With HIV and hepatitis at the time, although for some reason, I don't know about you, hepatitis didn't scare me. It, you know, I kind of I couldn't really see it. It was bloodborne, but mm, anyway. HIV, however, made me really, really scared. It taught me about um, sharp safety. Uh, I, I cannot recall how many times I had blood tests done as a student nurse before mistakes I made where I managed to stab myself or the odd occasion where a, a surgeon threw a scalpel in my hand. And, but we learned very carefully how to manage our blades. Oscar von Jamison on the call, she helped teach me some of these things, how to pass an instrument carefully, how to put my blade into a receiver, how to pass the suture without stabbing the surgeon in the process. And we became very, very aware of our, our protection at that time. Because it was all bloodborne, it was stuff we could see, it was stuff we can relate to. And of course, then we had that whole septic case scenario where we, uh, we practically stripped naked at the end of the case at the front door of our theatres. Somebody was running around um, uh, preparing whole loads and loads of buckets, and those buckets all, of course, contained the sodium hypochlorite solution. And we would then, at the end of the list, take all of our dirty instruments, as they were, and pop them into the solution. And that hung around for, uh, sure, possibly for a period of time, you left your instruments lying in this hypochlorite solution. And we all thought we were doing something good. But the real truth is that we weren't. Um, and the, the truth is many, many lower and medium income countries have uh, resorted to soaking the instruments of what we assume to be for septic cases, normally in a 0.5% sodium hypochlorite solution. The reasoning behind that, um, from what I understand historically, was that we believed that would, it would protect us. It would protect the healthcare workers from bloodborne pathogens. This is a really nice paper that was presented by Christina Fast. Christina Fast runs a, a charity and she goes around the, mostly Africa educating people around um, CSSD and instrument decontamination. And in her work, she did a whole a series of research. And honestly, there is no evidence whatsoever that soaking instruments in sodium hypochlorite is safer for us. Uh, there is no evidence of that whatsoever. And to be honest, hypochlorite solutions 
are really, really, really detrimental to your instruments. They just end up rusting, and that rust has a whole bunch of other uh, implications for our patients and for our patient care. So it's outdated, it's ineffective, and please, I really and truly hope that we have stopped this practice. I know that there are still a number of provincial hospitals that practice this. I'm not 100% sure if anybody on the group still does this, but I'm, I, I, I doubt uh, and I hope that, um, that you will now move away from this practice. There is no logic whatsoever in taking a contaminated device or a, a dirty instrument and soaking it in, in this solution. The pathogen that is receiving the most humongous amount of attention at the moment is, of course, COVID-19. COVID-19 has affected everybody. It's affected us socially. It's affected, it is affecting us mentally, and it's affecting us in our theatres, our hospitals, um, and our CSSDs at the end of the day. What has COVID-19 taught us? While it's made us really aware of hand washing, all the RPC sisters on this call are probably going, oh, thank goodness, we've been telling you this for how many years now? Um, they feel a little vindicated because they've been teaching us, they've been telling us this is coming, and now it is here. So now at least we recall and we remember and we can follow our hand washing steps. We've learned a hell of a lot about social distancing. And for the first time ever, I honestly believe that we are so aware now of wearing PPE and wearing our PPE correctly. PPE in the CSSD is probably one of the trickiest factors or things to manage. Um, staff in CSSD are complacent when it comes to wearing of PPE. We spend our entire day knee-deep in blood and soil and all sorts of bits and pieces, so we're not scared of blood. However, we have forgotten that within the blood is potentially some form of pathogen. And now you bring to the fore this pathogen that we can't actually see. And it's really a tricky pathogen. But for the first time, we've realized the importance of wearing PPE. The truth is that nurses are dying. Our colleagues are dying. And we've realized now that we have to wear our PPE, thankfully. And I'd like to take this opportunity to make sure that on an ongoing basis, we actually have learned from this event. According to the International Council of Nurses, uh, this was published, as you can see, in June, on the 3rd of June, 2020, more than 600 nurses have died worldwide as a result of COVID-19. 600 nurses, wow. This um, article was published on the 11th of June uh, about South African healthcare workers. And if we have a look at this, uh, at the time it was published, I'm sure it's even worse now, 199 nurses infected with COVID-19. Only two deaths at the time, but sadly I would imagine that those statistics have changed. And this is really a real thing. So I think for the first time, we really understand that a pathogen not only can harm us, can harm our patient, and can harm our families. And now we're faced with managing these pathogens in our CCSDs and in our operating theatres and in our hospitals and in our wards. Staff who, are, uh, who work in wards are aware of isolation precautions, have looked after patients under isolation settings. In the CCSD, we've not done that before. We've not been exposed to these types of pathogens, and we're not, we're not used to this kind of scenario. We don't understand droplet transmission as well as everybody else does, or perhaps people in ICUs do. Uh, this is new to us. COVID-19, we know, uh, potentially can spread from person to person via direct contact with, uh, contact with, of course, respiratory droplets. It's invisible. It's in the air. We're used to being able to see the blood. We're used to being able to see where our risk is. Now we can't see our risk. And this is scary for us. Of course, we know that this can also be transmitted through fomites as an indirect contact and, of course, aerosol-generating procedures. There are some procedures in the CECD that 
within themselves, you know, while we're cleaning, we actually end up generating aerosols and therefore putting ourselves at more and more risk, which means how we manage instruments for COVID-19 in the CSSD is important and, of course, in the operating theatre. This pathogen is invisible. We can't see this one. Um, for the first time, we really have to be so cautious and learn, although this is not true, it's something we should have known all along. But did we really learn or listen carefully when it came to how to don your PPE? Do we follow the correct sequence? Do we know how to take off our PPE without contaminating ourselves? The staff who work in the wards, I think, are a little more experienced at that than we are in, in, in CSSD, and it's something that I think we need to focus on in terms of our education. Why are we more scared of certain pathogens? Remember I said earlier I was never scared of hepatitis. Why are we so scared of COVID? Should we be scared of COVID? Of course we should be scared of COVID. But the truth of the matter is all of these pathogens that we've been exposed to over these years are terrible. They can make us sick. They can be transmitted from patient to patient. And of course we can take them home. But this is the first time because of all the media retention, because of the fact that it's a little more invisible, uh, we are really and truly aware of the fact that these pathogens can can and will influence us. So, should we be scared of only COVID-19? No, we should be scared in general. And a lot of these steps we're talking about today, we should have been doing anyway for a long period of time. And honestly, I do believe we do know that. This is a paper published um, and was presented at uh, the World Forum for Hospital Sterile Supply. Just to chat about the World Forum, for, or World Federation, should I say, for Hospital Sterile Supply. Um, this is a society of, of, of people that focus on decontamination sciences, and I, I use that term with great pride. The people uh, that attend these conferences and who presented these conferences are CCSD managers. And these are CCSD managers with master's degrees and PhDs. I was fascinated to, to be exposed to this Congress uh, last year in The Hague. I was very uh, proud to attend it. Numerous, uh, um, a humongous uh, number of attendees and a phenomenal learning experience. And um, at this particular event, this paper was published. It spoke about exposure to biological materials relating to reusable medical device cleaning. This was uh, based in Brazil. And it looked at uh, numerous incidences between 2006 and 2018 where staff uh, were exposed, in this case, to bloodborne pathogens. And can you believe the statistics? 69.4% of the time staff were not wearing all of the required PPE. They looked at whether or not staff were wearing gowns. Remember, in many countries, the minimum level of PPE in the CSSD is a full gown. It's not an apron. Some countries will use just aprons. Um, of course, eye protection, wearing facials or goggles or some form of eye protection is critical. Masks in the CSSD environment is absolutely critical. And in this respect, they also looked at boots. And that's a whole other entity to itself is talking about protection in terms of what shoes we wear on the dirty side, especially in the CSSD. Yes, we want to be comfortable, but uh, do we want overshoes? Hmm, it's a debate that's been going on for years now already. But of course, we need to be in shoes that are protective. And we need to perhaps be in shoes that are cleanable who takes the responsibility for cleaning those shoes. All of these things, important factors that we need to think about. And also, I think the one thing that I'm hoping we learn out of this event is to take our level of PPE up a little bit, not just an apron. We need to make sure that we're not exposing our arms anymore. And what type of uh, material are these things made of? Are we wearing material gowns? Is that sufficient? Is that good enough? Uh, should we be wearing something that's more impermeable? things to think about about going forward. So historically it is very true and I think there's quite a lot of evidence and if we went digging into all of the published papers around this, it is true that healthcare workers are not great at wearing their PPE and in, in my own experience I've actually had to start disciplining staff 
in order to enforce them to wear PPE. This COVID event has hopefully taught us and made us so much more aware of the need for PPE and hopefully we will continue to wear our PPE properly and the correct types of PPE going forward. In webinar two, we will go into a lot more detail around the operating room. We'll go into detail about the PPE that you should be wearing under, um, under what types of circumstances, looking at intubation, looking at anesthetics, um, how we decontaminating the anesthetic machine, what puts us at risk with aerosol generating procedures in COVID, for example. What are we doing with our laryngoscope blades? Um, what are we doing with the laryngoscope um, handles? Are we, are we wiping them down? Are we using the sponge that the surgeon washed his hands with to clean off the laryngoscope blade, rinsing it under the tap, using the hand soap, the, you know, that red stuff that's, uh, that's over there, not using the correct types? Of, are we disinfecting our laryngoscope blades? Is there need to be sterilizing them? Do you actually know what the manufacturer's instructions say? We'll look at that. We'll look at about what we meant to be doing in the operating room uh, for managing our instruments before they leave the operating room. And very importantly, then we'll cover the correct transportation of contaminated instruments and devices. We tend to be quite good with managing the linen, I hope. You know, we put our dirty linen in the right, uh, in the right receptacle. we wearing the PPE when we're transporting linen, I hope. But we don't always think about that when we're transporting our dirty instruments. Often we end up throwing everything on a trolley and maybe we take the, the gown that we used, you know, the linen gown, and we cover that over the trolley and we assume that to be sufficient. And I don't know that that is. In fact, I'm very sure that it isn't. And we need to take it up a, a level. In webinar three, which is going to be part one of cleaning, we are going to cover thorough cleaning of contaminated instruments, devices using manual and ultrasonic cleaning. There's just so much information around cleaning and how pertinent it is, and as, as many of you know, that's exactly what my master's focused on, is how well we, we are or aren't cleaning our instruments in our CCSDs in South Africa. Here we'll cover PPE in the sequence of donning and doffing. Um, I always get a bit nervous trying to say that we're doffing because I keep thinking it's going to come out as doffing, you know, like we all do. No, no, anyway. So donning, putting on, and of course doffing, removing our PPE. And important that we learn that sequence correctly. We'll look at devices from the wards, the devices from the maternity unit, devices from ICU, and of course the devices from theatre that need to be cleaned in our CSSDs. And we'll cover some insights from a... Um, an international based, uh, she, was from, she is from America, Nancy Turbin. Um, uh, some insights from uh, a webinar we attended on that on COVID 19 information for sterile reprocessing stuff, what you need to know. That'll be covered in webinar three. As you may all be aware, uh, this series of webinars will be run every Thursday at the same time. In webinar four, we're going to get get into the detail of automated washer disinfectors. Remember the goal of these webinars is not to cover the basic stuff that we do in our courses. It's not to cover the basic CSSD stuff. It's not to cover um, even what we cover in the advanced course. This is to take us a step further, more in depth, looking at published papers and looking at more detailed information so that we can really understand what's going on. We'll look at the ISO standard 15883 around um, automated washer disinfectors and what it is or how it is automated washer disinfectors uh, function. Because if we select the incorrect cycle, we really and truly will be doing ourselves a disservice. We'll put ourselves at risk. We'll look at what can be cleaned, what should be cleaned in, autom in our automated washer disinfectors, how they should function, how they should be maintained, how they should be managed, how to test them, how to load them in greater detail. We'll look at a whole bunch of pap uh, published papers around that. We'll go into the in-depth of that. Webinar 5, the last webinar in our series of this particular series, we will look at reprocessing flexible endoscopes contaminated with pathogenic microorganisms. We'll go through SANS 373, that's the South African standard on reprocessing of flexible endoscopes and accessories. You may be aware of numerous published papers around um, CRE and transmission of CRE relating to flexible scopes. 
there's numerous published papers on that. There's been quite a bit of work that's been done recently uh, by Cory Ofsted. She's been published quite a bit on bronchoscopes and worrying about bronchoscopes and COVID. And of course, there's the whole move towards sterilizing bronchoscopes and that's being done in low temperature sterilizers. We'll also look at G's and C scopes around COVID. And there are quite a few statements that have been released and information that have come out of, for example, the Society of Gastroenterology around um, managing patients, doing uh, scopes on patients that are, are COVID positive and what it is we need to do to manage that. So hopefully you will stay with us for the series of webinars and you'll want to join all of them. Um, hope they, they should have some provide some good insights into all sorts of pathogens and all sorts of things we need to worry about, not just COVID, but of course around COVID. In the last couple of weeks, Nanette and I have been inundated, is the word I'd like to use, with queries and questions around managing instruments contaminated with COVID or what to do with patients in theatre that are COVID positive. And these questions um, have been alarming and scary and um, in the end, we decided we would write a, um, the CFSA, the CSSD forums of South Africa decided that they'd write a, an SOP geared specifically towards instruments contaminated with pathogenic microorganisms like COVID-19 and CRE. To be honest, we really shouldn't need a separate or different uh, SOP around these types of instruments because all instruments are contaminated and we should assume them all to be contaminated and they should almost in essence get exactly the same uh, level of treatment. Um, there are some nuances around um, um, instruments contaminated with COVID around aerosol generating, aerosol generating procedures and that's really the only nuances. The rest to be honest, is exactly how we should be treating all instruments. But this uh, SOP has some slight variants to it. There's some um, um, parts to it that may not be um, exactly the same in everybody's policies and procedures throughout the various groups. There's certain aspects of, uh, of it that are, are relevant, certain aspects of it that you need to take into cognizance what your own facility or group has to say around that. But we can share the information as and when it's required. What matters though is that we end up cleaning and decontaminating our instruments correctly and properly. For those of you who haven't done so, and if you are um, social media types, please, if you go to uh, Facebook, type in the CSD Forums of South Africa, you will find our page and go ahead and like us. We um, post as much as we can. My job description says that I have to remain abreast with all sorts of things that are going on, which means I, I spend a huge amount of time following uh, all sorts of social media feeds as well as published papers and literature around our speciality area and we will uh, share that information and a lot of it we share on our on our Facebook page for, for you to keep yourself abreast with what's happening. Thank you Nanette, she's posted it in the chat box. You can see what to type and you will find our page. The prickly topic of single-use devices under pandemic conditions. We all know that without a doubt the law states, even in South Africa, that we may not reuse a single-use device and we are never going to advocate for the reuse of a single-use device. However, as we know, under these pandemic conditions, there have been certain um, concerns and a terrible lack of supply around some of the items that we desperately need to protect ourselves. And as a result, for example, the FDA have released a whole bunch of um, a well known as emergency um, statements around items that they will allow you to, for temporary, uh, under these circumstances, to decontaminate with a series of guidelines on how to go ahead and do that on the recontamination, or the, sorry, the reprocessing of single-use items under these pandemic conditions. Things that have been done or things that are being processed or reprocessed that are single-use include masks, surgical masks, um, N95 masks, or, um, and um, surgical gowns. There are numerous papers 
that have been published around this. There um, are white papers that have been published. There's published literature in journals. Um, there are a whole bunch of guidelines around that. And we've done a lot of work, Nanette and, I, and myself, on researching all of these factors. Uh, we have some concerns about what's going on in the hospital, and I'll talk to that a little bit in a little bit more detail in the next slide. But what we do know is that certain devices um, and pieces of equipment that are available in South Africa, um, like ultrasonic, um, ultrasonic, no, try again, ultraviolet uh, devices that, that use ultraviolet to decontaminate masks have been uh, used and are being used to a degree. And um, there's low temperature sterilization that has been approved for use of, of re-sterilization of certain single-use devices. Again, I reiterate, this is not a practice we condone under any normal circumstances. But if we find ourselves in a scenario where we don't have any PPE and we need to start putting these practices in place, um, then we have a multitude of information around this. The one thing I need to talk about, please, is that we're seeing stuff in the field, and again, like I say, we've been inundated with all of these queries, and I know for a fact that at hospital level, things are happening that, that hospital head offices may not know about. Please do not be making masks out of uh, your wrapping materials without consulting somebody at head office. At the moment, I'm aware of hospitals that are now starting to reprocess single-use gowns, um, and um, there's a method around it. It is possible to do it. There is some published work on it, but you may, please don't do this without consulting your heads of IPCs, without consulting your, your head offices. If you're doing this on, on, the, on the ground level, you are going to be taking a risk. You can't do this without a risk assessment. We're aware of people that are, are thinking of using used wrap, used wrap, I tell you, to make aprons with. I've heard of people using um, new wrap to create some form of headgear. I'm not exactly sure what's happening with this headgear. Perhaps it's being used in the ICUs. Um, uh, people have made masks. There have been posts on social media saying, you yeah, are for sure the um, bacterial filtration efficacy on a mask, on, on wrapping material, is good, if not better, than that of a mask. Remember, there are a number of, um, of test methods that apply to, use, to masks, and it's not just BFE. BFE is one factor, but you really need to understand, if you're trying to do things like this, what the implications are. I reiterate, uh, if you need to do these strange, un, unfathomable but odd things, please do not do anything without consulting your head office that a risk assessment can be performed before doing any of these practices if you have to, and I pray you don't have to. So on the slide, what we were referring to is this published paper from the British Journal of Surgery that looked at the number of cases, surgical cases, that have been uh, postponed or cancelled as a result of COVID-19. As you can see over there, it's estimated that over 28 million procedures have been cancelled or postponed uh, during the weeks of the disruptions due to COVID-19. Um, in here, the statistics for South Africa in this published paper were we were cancelling approximately 12,795 cases per week throughout our country. And the point that they were making in this paper is that their best estimate is that even if we increased our surgical volume by 20% after the pandemic, it would take 45 weeks to clear this backlog of operations. And that's going to have a huge impact on us, a huge impact on us from a staffing perspective and as well as from um, having all the right goods that we need to be able to perform that surgery. So I think we need to in the back of our minds think about this. We still need to go through our peak, as we know. There will be times where our surgical cases are even less than they are at the moment, I'm sure, but they will pick up and we need to be prepared for that. Another aspect I'd like to focus on, and we're almost running out of time, so um, amazing where the time goes on these kind of chats, and that's around our mental health. Nanette and I have been attending a virtual congress for the last um, week or so. And one of the aspects that we, we or one of the lectures we attended was around mental health, uh, presented by Professor Neil Greenberg from the UK. 
And the fact is that he, he's been focusing, of course, his mental health around COVID-19 for healthcare workers. And um, he, in fact, shared a published paper. I'll show you that on the next slide if you, if you would like me to share it. I'm sure we can. Uh, the risk factors, the risk factors of people developing uh, mental health issues post-pandemic uh, conditions include people that are younger and more junior and less experienced. And the things that they are seeing, by the way, uh, from mental health issue perspective is um, um, symptoms like PTSD, uh, depression and anxiety. Those tend to be what people are developing. Those that are more at risk, as I said, are those that are younger and a little less experienced. People um, or, or healthcare workers who have very dependent children, perhaps special needs children, uh, people that are, are, are um, single mothers and one income families uh, the, uh, that are, are, are really nervous of, of trying to keep themselves safe under these scenarios to protect their children. People that have been in quarantine, often um, staff themselves have been in quarantine. People who are lacking um, uh, practical support and people who, who may be affected by the stigma of us being um, faced with this COVID-19 day in and day out. Factors that can help us from a mental perspective include clear communication, um, how we perceive whether or not we have adequate PPE, uh, whether we get adequate rest or not. And the other thing that, um, that they spoke about, about our own uh, mental health is try to think of, sit down and write yourself a brief list of five things that you do uh, on a regular normal basis when you're not in panic mode uh, to keep yourself sane. From a mental health perspective, um, one of the, the factors that were shared in this particular paper were what matters is knowing that we have access to a reliable PPE so that the PPE itself is of, of good quality, but there is also a source of PPE. Um, the other important thing is our perceived level of training. Not only that we um, have been trained in donning our PPE and doffing our PPE, but um, that we believe we have been properly trained. I know that um, our infection prevention sisters in our hospitals are spending hours teaching people this, but it's important that we've actually managed to learn it. And um, I think those are very important factors. And another very important clear factor is clear and honest communication. Please be frank, please be honest with people um, around this, this, this kind of scenario. Okay, so in summary, what have we looked at today? We spoke around the decontamination process. We reminded ourselves about pathogenic microorganisms. We spoke about the reuse of single-use items under pandemic conditions. We spoke about COVID-19 and its implications for the operating room and uh, the CSSDs. And we focused and touched a little bit on our mental health and trying to maintain our mental health under these difficult circumstances.